We are continuing on in a series for the month of July that we're calling Anchors. And what we're doing is we are working to tie ourselves off to truths that hold in every season of life. If things are really great or things are really hard or they are somewhere in between, we're taking five weeks to go to places in God's word that will give us firm footing to stand on and give us things that we can tether to that will never change and never move and can hold us fast no matter what is going on in our lives. And this morning we will be in Isaiah chapter 66. We are going to be not even in one verse, we're going to be in half a verse today, the second half of verse 2 in a message called The Person God Honors. It is hardwired into us as humans to care about and to crave recognition from other people. So much of our lives are built around the effort to have other people see us and notice us and recognize us. And this happens in so many different ways in our lives. It's, it's why young men uh, crack jokes and show off so that they can get the girl to notice them and go on a date with them. They just want to be seen. They want to be recognized. They want to be honored. It's why you might uh, show, some, show some initiative and put in extra hours at work so that you will be seen by your boss and you will be promoted and you'll be given a raise and you'll be given more responsibility. You want to be seen and you want to be recognized. It's why all of us, when we were young, we worked our very best to get good grades or to win the game or to succeed at the thing that we were given so that our dad would just be proud of us. We want to be seen and we want to be recognized. We want to be honored. We want to be held in high esteem. And one of the things we innately know is that the the more dignified the person, the more valuable or important the person, the harder it is to gain their recognition and the more valuable it is when you have it. The more valuable it is that you are honored by a person of importance. This morning I want to ask and answer this question. What would it take to be honored by God himself? With other people, maybe it's the jokes, or it's the hard work, or it's the creativity, or the initiative, it's the gifts, it's the ability that gets other people to look at us and to honor us. What would get God to look at us and to recognize us, to honor us, and to hold us in high esteem? What would that take? Isaiah 66 verse 1 says this, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me and what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. So God says, I am the almighty creator. I spoke everything into existence. I rule over heaven and I reign over all the earth. You can't build me a house to make me more comfortable because I am all places at all times with all of my glorious presence. I am God, declares the Lord. And then this, but this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. This text very clearly tells us that God looks to a certain kind of person. Now, lest you think that God's look is merely his passive observation of people, if you look through the scriptures, they consistently reveal that the gaze of God is not merely his passive observation, it is his active blessing. Everywhere the Bible describes the eyes of the Lord and the look of the Lord and the gaze of the Lord, it is always in active blessing and support and protection and help. When God looks at you, he looks at you because he loves you and he intends to bless you. This is what happens when God looks. We see this all through the scriptures. Just so you don't have to take my word for it, 2 Chronicles 16, 9, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. He's looking for what? To give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him, a certain kind of person. 
Psalm 34, 15 and 16 shows us the positive and the negative of the look of the Lord. It says, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. That's the positive. Here's the negative. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The Bible clearly reveals to us that God looks, God honors a certain kind of person. You and I should be wondering this morning, does he honor us? Are we the kind of people that God would look to and bless with his favor and his esteem? Is it us? This short little half verse that we're gonna study this morning, it gives us a very simple description by which we can measure our lives to know if we are the kind of person God honors. And I don't know about you, but I wanna be that kind of person. I, like, if God is handing out blessing and favor and honor and provision and protection, sign me up, man. Like, I'm in. I will take some of that. What kind of person do I have to be for God to honor me? Well, here's our simple big idea. God honors those who rightly relate to him. God looks to, God esteems those who are rightly related to him. Those who engage with God in the way that he has commanded and the way that he has described in his word, those who rightly relate to him are the ones that he honors. So this morning, if you want the almighty creator God to look upon you with favor and to bless you, then he's gonna tell you how in just a moment here. And here's the reason I chose this for this Anchored series. Because the reality is that often we think that the kind of person God looks to must be a very strong and capable and virtuous and wise and gifted kind of person, right? Like we live, we breathe the air of meritocracy where you earn everything you have. And so certainly you have to earn the favor of God, right? He's looking through the land and he looks for the ones who have accomplished and the ones who are educated and the ones who are strong and the ones who are gifted and he gives his favor to them, right? Wrong, wrong. Thank God is right. He does not give his favor to those who are the best among us because that would leave all of us hosed. He doesn't give his favor to the strong and to the self-sufficient and to the good and to the wise. And this is why I chose this. Because no matter who you are, no matter how you walked into this room, no matter the context in which you find yourself, no matter the state of your heart or the circumstances of your life, no matter how full or empty your bank account, no matter what neighborhood you come from, you can be the kind of person that God honors. And in fact, what we're gonna learn in this text is that being this kind of person is not some unattainable achievement that is outside of your grasp. Maybe you think, well, I can't just become that kind of person. The text is going to show us that yes, you can. It is not about innate characteristics about you. It's not about your gifts. It's not about your capacities. It is about the posture of your heart and the way you relate to the one who made you. We're gonna find out that you, no matter what season you're in, maybe you are in a season of immense suffering or incredible prosperity, or maybe you're somewhere in between, you can be the kind of person that God honors. So what kind of person does he honor? Well, in the text, there are three very simple characteristics of the person God honors. And we'll unpack them like this. God honors those with, here's number one, God honors those with a realistic view of self. A realistic view of self. The text says, but this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble, The word humble here, it means poor. It means lowly or afflicted. Humility is not what it's commonly thought of, which is that you need to consider yourself, uh, you need to consider yourself less worthy. You need to consider yourself like dirt, like you don't have any dignity, you're not valuable. You need to loathe yourself and hate yourself. That's not what humility is. In fact, I think we'll see that humility is, here's a working definition, it is a proper perspective of myself that results from a proper understanding of God. A proper perspective of myself that results from a proper understanding of God. C.S. Lewis famously said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. 
And I think he was really onto something here because true humility doesn't actually begin by taking a look inward at yourself. True humility begins by looking at the God who made you. you when, whenever we do any sort of evaluation, we need a point of reference, right? Because everything exists on a scale. Everything is relative to one another and we need to know how to place it. We need a point of reference. This is something I'm trying to teach my three-year-old son, Titus, because he loves to speak in superlatives. He's always saying things are the most this or the best that, and I am frequently asking him the question, compared to what? Compared to what? Like, what is your point of reference? What's the standard by which you're measuring this? He loves to say, I am the strongest. In fact, last night we were in a Mexican restaurant, and I was uh, abdicating my responsibility as a father, and he was kind of wandering up and down the aisle by the booths where people are enjoying their quesadillas. And he is literally, he's walking like this, and as he looks at people, he's like, he'll take a step, and then he flexes, and then he takes a step, and then he flexes, <laughs> takes a step, flexes. I'm not joking. He's walking down the aisle, and he's going like this. And he's flexing his arms, because he thinks he is the strongest. And I'm constantly asking him, like, compared to what? What are you the strongest compared to? Because you know KJ, and he could outbench you with a straitjacket on. Like, you are definitely not the strongest ever, so what's your point of reference? Now, when it comes to the way you view yourself and you understand yourself, I think this is where we go wrong. We do not use God as our point of reference. We innately use one another as our point of reference. We look to other people, we compare ourselves against them, and then we decide what we should think about ourselves or how we should feel about ourselves. And here's the deal, no matter how you stack up in your comparison to someone else, if you use them, if you use the people around you as your point of reference, you will end up at the wrong destination. Consider two ends of a spectrum. Maybe on this end of the spectrum, you compare yourself to other people and you think, wow, I am very accomplished. <laughs> I, am, uh, I, I have built businesses I have impacted people's lives. Look at all this wealth I've accumulated. Look at all these things I've done. Look at all these poor plebeians who have not accomplished nearly as much as me. Maybe you compare and you're like, I've got this thing figured out. And so what you do is you abandon humility and you, you become puffed up with pride because you've used other people as your point of reference. Or maybe on the other end of the spectrum, you look at people around you and you think, I am nothing. I haven't accomplished anything. I'm not wise. I'm not strong. I'm not good. All these other people are better than me. And so what you do is you pity yourself and you mistake it for humility. Well, I must be nothing. And so you think I'm a humble person. But any self-focus, it precludes humility, true humility. In order to truly embrace humility, we need to look away from ourselves and look to God. And so the question is, what do I see if I look to God? Well, you could go a million places in God's word, but look at the verses just before the ones that we're studying. Verse 1. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made and so all things came to be. Just, just take those verses for instance. God says, I rule over heaven and earth. He's, he's referencing the time. Remember when David came to God and he's like, God, I'm gonna do you a big favor. I'm gonna build you a house. And God's like, seriously, David? <laughs> like, I am the omnipresent creator and sustainer. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I spoke everything into existence, and it is the word of my power that holds it all together, and you're offering me a bungalow. <laughs> like, really, David? I am God. This is what he's saying. So when we look to God, a God like this, a God who is big and majestic and holy, it puts us in our proper place. God is our point of reference. He is the sovereign God, and so I am subordinate to him. He is the creator God, and so I am fearfully and wonderfully made by him to bear his image. And yet he is the holy God who is a consuming fire, and I stand before him condemned because of my sin. So it is, it is looking to God that gives us a realistic and an accurate view of who we are. And I promise, I promise you, if you spend any amount of time looking to God, if you meet him in his word and you see his character and you begin to understand who he is, your response will not be one of pride. Adam said it last week. When people meet God, they hit the deck. When people see 
the God of the universe, and they begin to understand who he is, they get low before him. Why? Because they have a realistic understanding of themselves. This is the kind of person that God honors. Now, you might ask, why does it matter if I pursue humility? What does it matter? What difference does it make? Well, the Bible says this in at least three places. 1 Peter 5, 5, it says, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. Why? For God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Here's why this matters. Because if you are convinced that you don't need God, like you might not have the courage to say it out loud, but if you believe that and you live that way, if you're convinced you don't need God, if you're puffed up with pride, you live with self-sufficiency, I'm the master and commander, I say how it goes. If you're puffed up with pride, and you're convinced you don't need God, you may just find that God has nothing to offer you. What does God have to give to you if you don't even think you need him? God, not only will he be indifferent, did you read, did you hear it? God opposes the proud. If you wanna set yourself in opposition to the God of the universe, just be full of pride, and he will stand against you. But the, the converse of that is so encouraging. He gives grace to the humble, which means this. God loves to bless those who know they need him. Those who are most aware of their utter dependence upon God are the most consistent targets of his blessing. If you know you need him, if you have a realistic view of yourself before a holy God, you will be the target of his honor and his blessing. He gives grace to the humble. That's why it matters. Pride is delusional and it invites the opposition of God and humility is realistic and it invites the favor of God. Humility wins. In the upside down kingdom of God, you go low and you get raised up. You go low and you receive the favor and the kindness of God toward you. God honors those with a realistic view of self. The second characteristic of the person God honors, second characteristic of the one who's rightly related to him is this. God honors those with, number two, a repentant heart towards sin. God honors those with a repentant heart towards sin. The text says, but this is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit. Contrite is not a word that we use very often, but it means stricken or smitten. The, the idea of the word is somebody who bears a wound, like somebody who is crippled and altogether dependent on the help of another person. This is somebody who is con, who's contrite. And so here, contrite in spirit, I believe most closely means this, to be contrite in spirit. It means to be aware of and sorrowful over our sin to be aware of our sin and to be sorrowful over our sin. Very similar to what the Beatitudes say when they say, blessed are those who mourn. Who mourn what? Their own sinfulness, their brokenness, their, the gap that exists between them and a holy God. So this text is saying that God's honor is directed towards you if you are contrite in your spirit, if you are fully aware of the fact that you are stricken by sin and you grieve over it. Now, in a highly individualistic and therapeutic culture where you are what is most important in the world and what you feel and what you think is the ultimate arbiter of what is true and how the world should work and what is good and what is beautiful, you are that person to say, for God to say or for me to say that you and I should grieve over our own brokenness is heresy of the highest order because we live in the age of self-esteem and self-love and self-care and self-actualization and self-realization. You're taught that you need to love yourself and trust yourself and find yourself and express yourself. And anybody who tells you that what's inside of you is not ultimately pure and good and beautiful, they're just oppressing you and they don't love the real you. The, the problem is that's just not even a remotely realistic picture of who we are. Like, when was the last time you gazed into the depths of your own soul and you were like, oh, that is crystal clear and ultimately pure? For real? Are you serious? Like, maybe you're not like me, but I look inside myself and I'm like, what is wrong with you, man? 
Anybody else? Just me? Something's wrong with me. Like, I've got a problem. I'm not the solution. I'm the problem. But we, we hate that way of thinking in our day and age. We hate it. And yet the Bible reveals it. Do you know why? Because God loves you enough to tell you the truth about yourself. God is not interested in just making like fluff pieces and telling you, oh, you're just a pretty little flower and nothing's wrong with you and don't worry about it. And covering over the devastating effects of sin that have corrupted the entire human race, us included. And this is what the Bible consistently reveals. The Bible reveals that we are fractured and corrupted by the indwelling presence of sin. It is both our nature and our choice and that that has earned the righteous condemnation of a holy God and has created a gap between us and him. It has alienated us from the one who created us. This is what Isaiah 59 two says, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. He has hidden, here it is again, his face from you. When when your life is marked by sinful rebellion against your creator, when you disobey his law and you break his commands and you dishonor his holiness, his face is hidden from you. He will not look at you. And when we understand the weight of this reality, it should cause us to mourn the presence and the power of sin in our lives. Now, here's what's so beautiful about this. You're, you might be thinking, well, I thought this was an anchor that's supposed to like hold us in every season. This doesn't seem encouraging that I am full of sin and I am corrupt. Here's what's so encouraging about it. Awareness of and sorrow over your sin is not what God uses to pound you into the ground and to shame you and to condemn you. It is actually what God uses to bring healing and transformation and new life to you. And and here's why. It's a simple principle. You cannot solve a problem you will not admit you have. That's that's the simple fact of the matter. It's why God reveals our sinful condition to us. Because he's the one who provides the solution in the finished work of Christ. The reason we have a gospel, the reason Jesus came to earth and died on the cross was to pay for our sin and corruption and wash it as white as snow. And the reason he rose from the dead is so that he could conquer the death that belonged to us by virtue of our sin and give us the gift of eternal life instead. If you never admit that you have a desperate sin problem and that you desperately need God, if you never sorrow over the gap that exists between you and God, then you will never be able to claim the grace that God has given you to close that gap. We need to sorrow over our sin. We need to have a repentant heart towards sin. Now, this awareness, this contrition of our sinful condition, this is not self-loathing. This is not self-hatred. The Christian response to sin is not any of those things. It is repentance, which is different than all of those things and better. Repentance very simply is this. Repentance is a very visceral word, which means I am heading in one direction and I turn around and go the other direction. That's what repentance means. It is both an entrance requirement into the kingdom of God, because the Bible tells us that all of us by nature are born running away from God. And what we have to do is stop in our tracks, turn 180 degrees back towards God and start moving towards him. That's repentance. I leave my life of sin and my pattern and my trajectory. I leave it behind and I turn to God and now I trust in him. This is repentance. Despite the fact that we often associate repentance with like this sort of doom and gloom, like I've got to wear a black hood and whip myself on the back and it's going to be awful. Like make no mistake, repentance is sometimes painful and difficult because it means you have to uncover sin. You have to confess it. You have to be aware of it. You have to turn away from it. It's painful. Make no mistake. And yet what the Bible promises will happen if you repent is glorious. It's glorious. Acts chapter 3 Peter heals the lame beggar and all the people rush around and they're like, what is this all about? And Peter preaches the gospel and this is one of the things he says. Acts 3, 19 and 20, he says, repent therefore. So he tells them, turn around, repent therefore and turn back and look at what he says will happen. Same promise is true for us today. That your sins may be blotted out 
and that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. This is such a good promise. Because I think often we are afraid that if we confess our sin and if we repent from our sin, it's gonna lead us to shame. It's gonna lead us to deprivation. We're not gonna have what we once had and it's gonna be worse on this side and it's gonna be dark and it's gonna be heavy and it's gonna be hard. And the Bible actually says the exact opposite. The Bible says that waiting for you on the other side of repentance is life and joy and freedom and spiritual vitality. He calls it times of refreshing. It's almost as if living in your sin is like being a man or a woman walking out in the desert who's been out there for days with no water and your lips are cracked and your body is wasting away because you don't have anything and then you stumble upon a flowing stream of crystal clear water and you drink deeply from it. It's times of refreshing. This is what repentance would do for your life. And guys, we need to hear this message today. We need this message. And here's why. Here's why. Because I know that there are people who sit in this room who live in habitual patterns of unconfessed sin. You live in rebellion against God. And most of the time, you know it's wrong and you know he has prohibited it and you do it again and again and again. And then you wonder why your spiritual life is stone cold dead and you long for revival and you long for freedom and you long for peace, but you're unwilling to give up your sin and the two will never go together. You must confess your sin and repent from it. And then and only then, the floodgates of God's mercy will open upon your life. And it's like you will experience a revival in the times of refreshing. Because if you hold on to your sin, and maybe you've even got it in your mind right now what that thing is, as long as you hold on to it, Isaiah 59, 2 is true. Your iniquities have created a separation between you and God. And yet when you lay down that sin through repentance, when you are broken over the devastation of your sin and you lay it down and you walk away in obedience, God himself removes the separation between you and the source of all life and blessing is now near to you. And so you can have new spiritual vitality just on the other side of repentance. So what is it in your life? What sin have you clung to for so long? What is that thing that you are unwilling to give up? I would challenge you and encourage you not to leave this room until you have repented of that. Not as some sort of shame or condemnation or judgment, but as the loving invitation of your heavenly father to experience the full and abundant life that only he can give you. He loves you too much to allow you to persist in your sin. He commands you to confess your sin. And this is what he says in Psalm 32. Th these first two verses are a picture of what happens when your sin goes unconfessed. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. That's opposition. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. But David, what happened when you confessed and when you repented? Verse five, I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Your bones do not have to waste away within you. You don't have to have the hand of God heavy upon you. If you'll just confess your sin, 1 John says he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It is freedom and favor in the highest order to be liberated from sin and to have a clear account before God. God honors those with a repentant heart towards sin. There's one more description, one more characteristic, and it's this. God honors those with a reverent approach to scripture. A realistic view of self, a repentant heart towards sin, and a reverent approach to scripture. Verse two of Isaiah 66 says, but this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit 
and trembles at my word. To tremble in the context of God's word is to have a weighty reverence. The Bible also calls this fear, to fear God. The Proverbs say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, to revere God, to be rightly and appropriately in awe of him, to stand in fear. And here specifically the reference is not just to God himself, but to what God has said, to his word. God will look to those who tremble at his word. When I was in college, I had a professor who taught my biblical interpretation class and his name was Dr. Baird. He was kind of a legend around GCU. He had a very commanding presence. He had a giant white goatee, very deep well of wisdom, and he commanded respect in his classroom. In fact, you were not allowed to use laptops or cell phones. You were not allowed to have sidebar conversations, no bathroom breaks. You got in that classroom on time. You sat down, took out a paper notebook, shut your mouth and opened your ears and started scribbling your pen when he talked. Now, there was one day, he was kind of zero tolerance. There was one day Dr. Baird is lecturing at the front of the room, and in the back of the room, these two girls foolishly decided to have a little chit-chat while he's lecturing. And so all of us in the middle could kind of hear Dr. Baird lecturing, these two girls talking, uh, until finally Dr. Baird stopped right in the middle of his sentence and let the room just be quiet. Now these two girls unawares that Dr. Baird has stopped talking, became the only source of noise in the classroom. So that slowly, like every head is kind of turning like this, like, do you realize what you've done? (laughs) We're all like looking back at these girls and after a moment, they realized their voices were the only ones in the room and so they stop and they look up at Dr. Baird and everyone kind of like swivels back around to see what he will do. And he goes like this, Dr. Baird, is standing at the lectern and he looks at them. And then he just kept lecturing. (laughs) He picked up his sentence right where he left off and kept going without a word. And like awe and fear fell upon that classroom and no one said a word for the rest of the semester. Do you know why? Because... Dr. Baird had something to say. And so when he spoke, you listened. And that is an, that is an infinitely minuscule analogy for the appropriate response we should have when God speaks. And he does speak. Think of uh, the Israelites in Exodus 20, immediately after they have received the Ten Commandments on the mountain. It says, now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and they trembled. And they stood far off. And look at what they said. They said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. They were appropriately afraid of the ferocious presence of a holy God. They they were afraid they couldn't even hear him speak or they would be melted like wax. How close is that to our relationship with our Bibles? Because if you're like me, That is often not my attitude towards the Bible. And yet what I need to be reminded of if I want the favor and the blessing of God in my life is that God has spoken to me. And that when I hold a Bible in my hands, I have the very voice of God inscripturated, inscribed on the page so that we can know him and understand him and walk with him. We do not have a God who hides from us and obscures himself and is playing some cosmic game of hide and seek. Like if you're really smart, you can find him and figure him out. He is a God who speaks to us and reveals himself and says, here I am and you can know me. And the primary way he has revealed himself is in his word. If we were graphing the ways that God has revealed himself, The Bible bar graph, the the part of the graph, it would be off the charts for how God reveals himself. And the second item would be like hardly noticeable. 
That's how significant the Bible is in the self-revelation of God. It takes the first place and second place isn't even close. We ought to listen and regard and approach our Bibles with reverence because this is the holy word of God. But too often, that's not our response. Too often, myself, and I'm sure you too, we're flippant towards the word of God. We're not reverent, we're, we're careless. We're dismissive, we're ignorant. We choose not to even engage with it. And if you're like me, Oftentimes, I take it so for granted that I have 500 copies and translations of the word that God has spoken that I allow it to gather dust on my shelf from week to week. And instead, I doom scroll Twitter for three hours instead of sticking my nose in the book that God inspired and that saints for all the ages have spilled blood so that we can have it in our hands. Why? Why do we do that? We ought to, with fear and reverence, approach the word of God and hear what it says. If we would be a church and if we would be individuals who are marked by the favor and the honor of God, if we want the gaze of God to be directed towards us, we cannot have that apart from knowing, understanding, and doing his word. We need to be men and women of the book when, when you cut us, we should bleed the Bible. The way we think should be shaped by the Bible. The way we act and pray and think and give and go, the way we live should be completely shaped by what God has revealed. We should stand in reverent fear of a God who has spoken and we should listen. Now, maybe you think to yourself, okay, sounds good preacher man, I want to reverently approach the scriptures, but how do I do it? How do I do it? How do I approach the word? Well, here's six ways, six hopefully practical things to you, six ways to approach the word. They'll all show up together. Desire it, need it, know it, trust it, share it, and do it. Six ways. First, desire it. The first order of business is to cultivate a desire for the word of God. It it, it all boils down to this. Despite every excuse in the world that you might have about why you don't read your Bible, the reason you don't read your Bible is because you don't want to. That's why. And you need God to rearrange by the power of his spirit your desires. You need to cultivate a desire for the word. And you might think, well, you know, don't desires happen to me? I don't think I can change my desires. You certainly can influence them. Do you know how? You can starve desires out of your life. It's possible. And you can rearrange your appetites and the things you crave and the things you want. There's a physical analogy for this. It's called fasting. If you're like addicted to sugar and soda and you have like a really hard time with that, I dare you to not eat anything for 72 hours and then eat a strawberry. And you will never need sugar again. You'll be like, God made desserts? This is amazing. Because you eat a strawberry and if you haven't eaten for three days, it's like the sweetest thing your lips have ever tasted. And what happened when you fasted? You recalibrated your desires. That's what you did. And you can actually do that in your life. If, you have got an, if you've got an ocean of like garbage inputs in your life, in terms of your entertainment and your music and your relationships and your social media and all the things that you just inundate your life with, it's no wonder you don't want the Bible. It's not nearly as exciting as a YouTube video. You have to recalibrate your desires. Try fasting from other things and spending time in the word and see if you don't develop a desire for what it says and what it can do. Psalm 19 verse 10 says that God's word is more to be desired than gold, even much fine gold. So that that if you stacked up a huge pile of money and a Bible, you'd be a fool to pick the money. You should pick the Bible so that you can know God, desire it. Number two, need it. When Jesus is fighting the temptation of Satan, In Matthew chapter four, verse four, he says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He quotes Deuteronomy. Now here's what I'm saying. You don't usually forget to eat because your stomach reminds you that your body needs nutrition. And I'm telling you that you need the word of God more than you need another bite of food ever. More than you need to physically eat, you need to nourish your soul on what God has said. 
And so allow your physical hunger to be a reminder that you need spiritual food way worse than you need physical food. You don't forget to eat, so don't forget to read your Bible. Don't forget to nourish your soul in what God has provided for you to know him. You need God more than you need another breath. And the Bible is where you meet him. Desire it, need it. Number three, know it, know it. Do you know the Bible? If you're like me, I'm willing to wager not as well as you'd like to. Do you know the Bible? When people ask you questions, is your, mind, is your mind populated with verses from God's word? When you're making decisions, are you using God's word as the grid by which you make those decisions? Are you able to say the word and love the word and meditate on the word and share the word because you know the word? If not, start spending time in it. Start memorizing it so that you can know it. Psalm 119 verse 11 says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. If you want to live a godly and holy and blameless life, you need God's word locked away in your heart so you can use it at a moment's notice. Know it. Number four, trust it. Psalm 33, four says that the word of the Lord is right and true. The word of the Lord is upright. You should, when you crack your Bible, operate on the assumption that God, the God who inspired it and the God who breathed it out, he is trustworthy and he knows what he's talking about. So believe the Bible. Trust in what it reveals. Number five, share it. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. The apostle Paul had this assumption when he was training Timothy, I've spoken the word of God to you. Now you speak the word of God to other people and those people will speak it to other people. You, if you know the word of God, you know it because someone shared it with you. So don't be a cul-de-sac for the word of God. Be a conduit for the word of God. You go to the word of God and receive it and then give it away. Say it to somebody. Text it to a friend. Talk to your children or your coworkers or your neighbors about it. Say and share the word of God. And you will watch the truths of those scriptures be more deeply rooted in your heart because you give them away to other people. Share it and then last, do it. Do it. James 1, says, do not be hearers of the word only. He says, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. If you spend time just accumulating biblical information so that you are like a storehouse of data points and your life doesn't change, you're missing the point of what God said. You're missing the point of us even having a Bible. If you're, if you're like doing your devotions and you're reading a little section of scripture and you close up shop and move on before you've asked the question, so what? What does this mean for my life? Then you have left too early and you've left the job undone. We have to ask the question, what does this mean for my life? How should I speak differently or think differently or live differently? Because God revealed this in his word. God's word has the power to change. This is what it does. These are six ways to approach the word, certainly not comprehensive, but a start. And the promise of God is that there is, there is reward. This is what Psalm 19 later says, that by your word, it says, moreover, by them is your servant warned, and in keeping them, there is great reward. God gives reward to those who highly regard his word and reverently approach his word. This is the kind of person that God honors. A person with a realistic view of themselves and a repentant heart towards sin and a reverent approach to scripture. As I was thinking about this text this week, I was talking to KJ and he said, you should go look at 2 Kings 22 and 23. And so I did. And it was very appropriate because if you go there and you read the chapter this week, you'll find that the nation of Israel was drifting into disobedience and idolatry and decay. And this young king, Josiah, who had, who had recently taken the throne, he told the high priest Hilkiah to go to the temple and to rebuild the temple, to find all the money and the materials and to refurbish the temple so that they could go worship there again. And Hilkiah came back to Josiah and said, we found something better than materials to rebuild the temple, we found the word of God. And the reason that the nation of Israel had fallen into such disrepair is that they had stashed away the copy of the law, God's word to them, and they had long neglected it. 
Hilkiah uncovered it, brought it to Josiah, and Josiah was cut to the heart, and he repented before God, tearing his clothes and reading the scriptures to the entire nation who would listen, and then starting to do all that they commanded. And they started to celebrate the Passover and the feasts, and they rededicated the temple, and they tore down all the ashram and the idols, and they started to worship God again. And God brought judgment, but he also brought revival, and he brought great blessing. And if you this morning want a spiritual revival in your life, it may take a Josiah kind of moment. It may take a moment where you decide that you will rediscover the scriptures that you have long neglected. And in those scriptures, you will allow them to paint a realistic portrait of who you are and what you need. And you will allow them by the spirit to move you to repentance for your sin and into times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. And it just may be that if you are willing to humble yourself and to repent and to revere God's word, that he will lavish his blessing upon you, that you could leave this room the kind of person that God himself will honor. This is why the Bible says things like this in Numbers 6, and this is what I would say to you as you go today. May God bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. God is still looking at people today, these kinds of people. For God's glory, may we be these kinds of people and may we see the very face and favor of God on our lives. Let's pray.